the one time that I was the most filled with awe, and it was only recently discovered, there's a silver mine in north central Mexico. There were miners that were 900 feet underground, and they accidentally broke into a chamber. This chamber was about the size of a basketball court, and it was filled with the largest crystals that anyone has ever seen. These white, some of them were 30 feet long and weigh 55 tons. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we talk to athletes, adventurers, and business owners from around the world of adventure sports. Whether you're climbing Mount Everest, starting a bike shop, or getting up off your couch to take your kids hiking for the first time, we want you to have the motivation and inspiration you need to chase that next adventure. The Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by Camp Crate, the leaders in fully planned self-guided backpacking adventures, as well as backpacking gear rental. You can check them out at campcrate.net. Hey folks, today's episode was originally, let me check, episode 89 from September 18th, 2015, and it's featuring George Karunas. He is a storm chaser, he's an explorer, I mean, he, he, he follows stories, he's worked on, uh, uh, for National Geographic, hosted the Angry Planet TV show, he's worked for CNN, BBC, he's a great storyteller, great speaker, and he's been on the show a couple times before, so you'll you probably recognize him if you've been a long time listener. But this one, this one deserved another listen. And uh, you know, we, we we do these Throwback Thursday episodes because so many of you are so new to the show, and we have had some incredible guests over the last four years. That you know, we know we we know we release a lot of episodes compared to most shows, so it's hard to keep up. So we want to make sure you listen to some of the good ones from way back way back in the day. Anyway, it is May and summer is right around the corner. Man, I'm so stoked. I can't I can't even express it. Gosh, I'm so happy. It's been a long winter. I don't know how it's felt for you, but it has felt like a long winter. Um but we do we do have a new sponsor. Um I'll go in through our sponsors and I'll I'll mention them last. But today's episode's brought to you by Athletic Brewing. They are the makers of non-alcoholic craft beer. They are also funding our adventure grant, which is open. Applications open till May, uh, June 1st, so another month. And then we announce it on June 15th, who is the winner. Super stoked about that. So somebody, somebody that listens to this show is getting $1,000 to do their adventure this year. Next year, we hope we can offer ten grand. I can't make any promises, but we're going to try our best. <laughs> And then we have CS Instant Coffee. They make 100% Arabica coffee with compostable packaging. So you can take it into the backcountry, hunting, fishing, on a job, business trip, or whatever. Super portable and very good coffee. Show is also brought to us by the new sponsor, which is Nomadic. They are the makers of a subscription box filled with outdoor gear chosen by outdoor enthusiasts. And there is a link in our show notes that will take you to a giveaway that we're doing. Three listeners are going to get, I think for three months, a subscription box free um, filled with gear, like 60, 70 bucks worth of gear. It's an incredible deal. And uh, yeah, go go to the, follow the link, the nomadic.com slash ASP and uh, sign up. All right, let's get into this episode. And uh, like always, share us. Uh, we're, we're doing great this year. This is our best year ever so far. Um, let's keep it up. Please share us. Let us know if you want to support us on Patreon, which is financially five bucks a month to basically be a supporter of the show. It really means the world to us. Um, also, if you know any good guests for the show, let us know. There's a number of ways to get a hold of us, and that's all in the show notes, too. All right, here's the episode. A life full of adventure doesn't always involve sports. George Karunas is with me today to discuss just how true this is. George has been a storm chaser since 1997 and has been documenting tornadoes, hurricanes, blizzards, floods, hail, lightning, and much, much more for the Angry Planet TV series as well as the National Geographic Channel. 
He's found himself hanging inside active volcanoes in Ethiopia and filming on the edge of molten lava lakes with only his protective heat suit between him and the 2,000-degree molten rock below. If that's not enough adventure, George has also spent his time documenting great white sharks, forest fires, and even mountain gorillas in Rwanda. George, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Travis. Glad to be here. Good to have you. So I read a few things off, but man, you've done so much more than that. You've been buried in snow caves. You've sailed around the tip of South America, visited boiling lakes, witnessed avalanches in the Dolomites. You've even been to Timbuktu. I have. Shouldn't you be satisfied once you've been to Timbuktu? You'd think. You know, I actually have a Timbuktu stamp in my passport, believe it or not. That's <laughs> that's a rare thing, I think. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Just, just a world of adventure out there. There's so much to see and so much to do. And basically what I do is I specialize in documenting extreme forces of nature. So whenever there's some kind of natural force going on, I, I, I don't always like to call them disasters because they only turn into disasters when we humans get in the way. Um, but uh, natural disasters and forces of nature, basically anything that Mother Nature has in her arsenal that is capable of killing you, I'm usually not too far away with a camera rolling. <laughs> well, that's definitely an adventure in and of itself, and we typically delve into the uh, adventure sports specifically. But when I was watching some of your stuff on Angry Planet, I was just amazed, you know, at, at the stuff that you do. And I'm thinking, this is adventure. You know, you don't have to be doing sports to to have an adventure. So I think you're the epitome of adventure out there doing all of these things, and you're really out there in the thick of it doing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I spent. Uh, I t- tallied it up. Just the other day, and just in the, in the past year alone, I think I've spent 217 nights away from home, traveling to places such as, oh man, uh, Newfoundland and Bangladesh and uh, Siberia, Laos, uh, Vanuatu and Australia and, and Tuvalu and Cape Verde Islands and the Brazilian Amazon, just all these different amazing places. And each place I go to is always going to be something completely different. Man, that is awesome. So take a little time and tell us, how did you end up doing this? Were you just this adventurous kid and thought, man, I'm just going to run around the world and document crazy (laughs) storms? Or did you accidentally slip into it? How did you get started? It's sort of a weird convoluted path. Uh, A lot of people think that it's a straight line, but it could, could be sort of couldn't be any farther from the truth. However, when I look back, it sort of does make a certain amount of sense. Uh, When I was a kid, I was always fascinated with uh, ocean exploration. Jacques Cousteau was my hero. I kind of wanted to be a marine biologist. So I always had an interest in nature and science and the outside world and the wildness of nature. And I remember as a kid swimming in a flooded creek nearby when there was a big rainstorm and riding my bicycle through hailstorms when I was a kid and getting yelled at by my <laughs> mom and you know giving her more gray hairs and I haven't stopped giving her her gray hairs after 45 years of doing just stupid things but um I I eventually got into uh music because that's the way you meet girls right of course. Once you hit puberty, then you just start thinking about other things. So I started studying music, and I went to university to study music, and then I switched to audio engineering, and I spent years working in recording studios and playing in bands, and that was all fun. And basically, I ended up working in a studio here, here in Toronto that did sound for film and television. So I got to learn a lot about how the business of television worked and how production worked and the lingo and the language of television And then once I hit about the age of 27, I really started to itch to get back into the things that I loved as a kid and getting into nature and such. And I got my first real good camera and I started taking photographs of lightning during summer thunderstorms and things just kept snowballing and I would take my extra time off. I would would bank my overtime at the studio I was working at and I would take time off for free, like unpaid time off and go storm chasing. Saw my first tornado in 1998 and got totally hooked into doing that every year. And and it just, just kept going until I developed this reputation for being the guy that was always on the scene when all hell was breaking loose somewhere. And I kept getting phone calls from BBC and CNN and various different news agencies and documentary filmmakers would call me to, to interview me for their programs. And next thing I know, I'm getting a tap on the shoulder to uh, to start up 
basically my own TV show about my life. So it's a great day when you have to quit a job that you like to go and do something you're absolutely passionate about. Yeah, no kidding. What a great story. It was really amazing. I remember it was, it was a Friday afternoon. I was working late at the studio. I get a phone call. It was a TV producer who read about me in the newspaper not not long after Hurricane Katrina. And I was in the middle of Hurricane Katrina in Gulfport, Mississippi, which was extremely hard hit, harder hit than New Orleans. And that story sort of got out about what I experienced there. And and the newspaper clipping sat on his desk for a long, long time. And then he sort of found it one day and thought, oh, yeah, I forgot to call this guy. He called me up that Friday uh, Friday sort of evening and and uh, we put together a meeting. And next thing we know, we're pitching the idea to various TV networks. And <laughs> one of them said yes. The Out the Outdoor Life <laughs> Network here in Canada. And originally the show was only going to be six episodes. They came back and said, we want to do the show, but can you do 13 of them instead of six? I said, okay. <laughs> then we did another 13. Then we did another 13. We just finished episode number 49 just last month. Wow. Wow. Good for you. It's been but you make a fantastic that. host. Your, uh, your enthusiasm for this, this kind of work and this lifestyle just leaps out of you as, uh, as you're watching the, the, the TV shows. You do a great well, job. Thank at you. It. I appreciate you using the word enthusiasm because – I'm not the I'm not the most uh, photogenic guy in the world. I'm not the most you know, you know uh, uh, I'm not the prettiest, I'm not the richest, I'm not the you know, I'm just like an average guy, but enthusiasm really goes a long way and I'm really enthusiastic and I just love doing this stuff and and I do it even when it's costing me money. I go on expeditions when I'm not filming the TV show just because I love to do this kind of stuff and and I'm glad that you appreciate that because I really hope that it does come through. A lot of the places that I go to like Siberia in the middle of the winter or going to the Timbuktu in, in the Sahara Desert. These are places that not pe- many people would want to go to themselves because it's so difficult and dangerous and just such a pain to go to some of these places, but they want to see them. So I take on that burden, gleefully, I take on that burden of all the challenge and the difficulty and dealing with the politics and permissions and permits and the hardships and the climate and the equipment and documenting all of this so that people can enjoy some of these spots on this wonderful planet that we have that very few people get to see with their own eyes. Yeah, and it's amazing to to watch that stuff and live it, live it through your your camera lens. My my son absolutely loves watching these shows and he's got his heart set on being a, a storm chaser. He's 11 years old now and he's he's imagining the vehicle that he's going to build to uh, to go intercept tornadoes and I told him I was going to have you on. He was just enthusiastic. He can't wait to hear the episode. So what would you say to him at 11 years old if he wants to be a storm chaser? Oh, that is so awesome. Uh, The best thing that he can do is just keep reading, 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 and studying and learning more and more. And when he gets a little bit older, you're going to hate to hear this. (laughs) But when he gets a little bit older, I actually work with a tornado chasing tour company. So we take people from all over the world who don't have experience with chasing storms, and we take them out for two weeks at a time across Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska, and they get to experience what it's like to live the lifestyle of a real storm chaser for two weeks at a time. Wow, that is cool. I had no idea that existed. It does. There's a a few companies, uh, small companies that do it. The one that I work with is uh, cloud9tours.com, and I've been working with them now for 12 years. And uh, let me tell you, it is just, we have a good time all the time. It's, it's just, it's an interesting vacation. The scenery in Kansas is not that interesting. If you like watching a dog run away for three days because it's so flat, <laughs> but the sky is what changes all the time. And when the when these right. supercell thunderstorms that form these tornadoes, when they, when they, when they happen, when they go up, some of these storms can be close to twice the height of Mount Everest. You can't fly a jetliner over top of these things. They're so huge. And all that energy and that rotation is just concentrated on this one spot in a farmer's field that's being ground up by this tornado. And being up close to that, close enough to be able to hear it, oh, it really makes you feel small. And it's just so awe-inspiring to see that. And, of course, it can be tricky and dangerous, so there's always that thrill element in, in there as well. Yeah, I guess if you ever want to be humbled, you just go out there and chase a couple of storms and oh, Mother Nature, know, find out what it is. She'll smack you down without without thought, <laughs> right? You, if you don't know what you're doing, like I've been doing this for, oh my God, I've lost track of the number of years. I've been a tornado chaser now for 18 years. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, you're either going to A, not see anything because you don't know how to do the proper weather forecast and you'll be 200 miles away 
or you can get yourself into some real serious trouble. I was on the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado a couple of years ago on May 31st, uh, 2013, and this was the world record largest tornado ever witnessed. It was 2.6 miles wide at its widest Holy point. Holy cow. And it killed two colleagues of mine, uh, three colleagues of mine, actually, that were on the other side of the tornado. We didn't know it at the time, but the thing was so huge that it didn't even look like a tornado. It was just a smudge on the landscape, just on the horizon, this dark mass. Yeah, I'll bet. And it was just ugly and violent. Sometimes they're pretty. You get this beautiful white side-lit tornado, and sometimes a rainbow beside it. And they can be these wonderful works of nature's art, but sometimes they can be dark and dangerous and just just menacing. Yeah, just an ugly mass of destruction. Absolutely. I remember my son telling me about that tornado two and a half miles wide. He said, Dad, the biggest re- uh, tornado out there they've ever recorded is two and a half miles wide. And I, was, it's, I can't even imagine that. Two and a half miles is a long way. Exactly. And there were some – I was on the radio warning some of my storm chaser friends who were south of me because I knew their position. And I knew from where they were, they weren't going to be able to see it as clearly as I could from my position. And I warned them that there was a large tornado headed their way, and they couldn't even see it. They're looking right at the storm, and they couldn't even see it because it was wrapped up in rain and such. So they they saw a few what looked like funnels, but they were actually these little suction vortices that that were orbiting around the larger circulation. It was two and a half miles wide, so... Even even the professionals, you know, looking at that that day had a hard time understanding what was going on because it was just so incredibly huge. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, you know, I grew up in New England, and out there, as you know, it's uh, you know on that side of the the, the country, or the continent for that matter, it's so hilly and there's trees everywhere, so you don't really get to see the storms approaching. You don't see the storm until it's pretty much overhead. And when I moved out to Colorado. The most fascinating thing to me was watching the electrical storms out on the horizon oh, yeah. and watching them come in for hours on end, you know, and, and where I was, you know, there's no issues, but you're just watching this thing approach. And it was just the most uh, fascinating thing to sit there and watch that. Yeah, and people don't think that Colorado gets tornadoes because they think all, you know, Rocky Mountains is what they think. But the eastern third of Colorado is extremely flat, and, it, and it's definitely part of Tornado Alley. I spent a lot of time in places like Sterling and Trinidad and all these these places where they they get quite a few tornadoes. I, one of the best tornadoes I've ever seen was in southeastern Colorado. Yeah, that's no doubt. We uh, I live in Boulder it's... County and just to the north of us. In fact, I was out of my motorcycle that night. Um, this was only a few months back and got caught um, out when the tornado hit and it actually took out some houses and whatnot. But it was right up against the foothills, which I've never seen before. Usually, they have to be out on the east side of the interstate of I twenty five to be uh be anything that makes damage and this thing came right up against the foothills and uh and it was it was really a sight to see out there being that close uh to the mountains like that. Oh there was one that was reported some twelve thousand feet up the side of Pike's Peak a couple of years ago. No kidding. Oh, yeah, yeah, you'd be surprised these that. things can form. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's why I find them so fascinating and so interesting because they're literally just these these whirlpools of water vapor that, that come and go due to a certain balance of different elements in the atmosphere and they're so fleeting and trying to be in exactly the right place at exactly the right time is a tremendous challenge. So it's very personally rewarding when we're successful at doing it. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit more about volcanoes. Now I I alluded to your enthusiasm. Now I have to mention you have so much enthusiasm about this stuff and specifically volcanoes that you chose to get married on one? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Not just married on a volcano, but one that was actively exploding. Um, that was an interesting marriage proposal. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. It was her birthday, and we went to our favorite restaurant. And uh, as dessert came, I got down on one knee. And of course, we have TV cameras rolling. I lied to her and told her that the the TV cameras were there because we, the the producers wanted some just some backstory on us, just just for the show. So I didn't tell her that she didn't know that I was about to propose. So get down on one knee and ask her if she wanted to get married, and she said yes. We've been together for nine years at that point, so we figured it was time. <laughs> she was surprised though, and then of course to sweeten the pot, I proposed to her that we get married on the crater's edge, or sorry, on uh, a beautiful tropical South Pacific island. <laughs> so now of course her ears have perked up and she's even even more interested and then I sort of sneak in there how about on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano 
And she she actually said yes to the volcano part of the question faster than she did the, to the will you marry me part of the question. And then six months later, we find ourselves flying out to the other side of the planet to uh, a small island nation called Vanuatu. I've been there numerous times now. It's full of volcanoes. And uh, there's one in particular called uh, Yasser Volcano on Tana Island. No one's ever heard of this place, but there's a volcano there that erupts every five minutes for the past 800 years. No kidding. So it's very reliable, and that's why I chose that one. It, I know <laughs> it's going to keep erupting, and there's no chance that it's going to stop because it always, always erupts. And it's, it's relatively small, so it's easy to climb. So there we are. I've got my uh, tuxedo on. She's got her wedding dress on. We, we're climbing the side. I'm feeling very much like James Bond at this moment in a tuxedo on the side of an exploding volcano. And then we had the ceremony right there on the crater's edge. We filmed the whole thing. There were uh, the locals performing the legal ceremony with grass skirts and feathers in their hair and face paint. And it was just magical. Athletic Brewing is pioneering non-alcoholic craft beer. Yeah, I said non-alcoholic craft beer. And there's a number of reasons you might want to do that. Whether you're training for an event, which a lot of our listeners are, or you know, if, you, if you're babysitting and don't want to be drunk in case something happens. I mean, stuff happens, but you still want to sit down and enjoy the game and have a beer. This is an incredible option for a full-flavored, full-bodied beer. Each can is only 50 to 70 calories. With IPA, golden ales, stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings, Athletic Brewing is a great option if you want that craft brewery taste, uh, but not deal with the effects of alcohol itself. Uh, if you'd like to save 15% on your first order, go to athleticbrewing.com and use the code ADVENTURE at checkout. Wow, if you could lie to a woman about the proposal, telling her the cameras are there for something else, and propose that you get married on an exploding volcano, and she sticks with you. Yes. That's worth hanging on to. Well, she's very cool. She's very understanding. She has to be to be married to me. I guess. And uh, <laughs> I could literally call her right now and say, honey, um, I've got to go to I gotta go to the airport. I have to go to the moon. <laughs> and she'd say, okay, bring me back something nice. <laughs> I want a souvenir. Yeah, and she'd, she'd be cool with that. I mean, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful that my uh, my family and my wife have all been very supportive. Um, I'm away so much, and the things that I do are sometimes inherently very dangerous, and uh, I promise to keep coming back in one piece. But it was really amazing as we're finishing up the ceremony, and we pop the cork on the bottle of champagne. The champagne comes shooting out, and the volcano has one last salvo of an eruption shooting molten lava hundreds of yards in the air it was just a beautiful beautiful thing to see and sort of a bit of a metaphor for marriage itself yeah no kidding that paints a fantastic picture And two days before (laughs) the ceremony i actually rappelled 60 meters down inside the volcano and had to dodge pieces of lava that were flying through the air over my head well i would say that's adventure that's adventure yes don't try this at home folks (laughs) Well, now that you bring that up, how about a story of your most amazing experience in your time of doing this? Oh, there's been so many. The one time that I was the most filled with awe, like jaw-dropping awe, was on a caving expedition that I did a few years ago in Mexico. It was a place called Nica, and it was only recently discovered. There's a silver mine in north-central Mexico, and they were ni- there were miners that were 900 feet underground, And they accidentally broke into a chamber. This chamber was about the size of a basketball court. And it was filled with the largest crystals that anyone has ever seen. These white selenite gypsum crystals. Some of them were 30 feet long and weigh 55 tons. Wow. Totally like something out of a science fiction movie. like, Like Superman's Fortress of Solitude. And... I just Google Nika, N-A-I-C-A, and you will be blown away by this place. And so I had the opportunity to go there. It's very tightly controlled. It took two years to get permission to go there for one day. And the environment inside the cave is as deadly as the cave is beautiful. 
the air temperature inside is about 126 degrees Fahrenheit with almost 100% humidity. Wow. So as soon as you walk inside the cave, the humidity hits you in the face like a sledgehammer. And it, it, you literally start dying because your body cannot shed your internal heat because the air is hotter than your skin. So you're absorbing heat. Plus the humidity is so high that you sweat, but it doesn't evaporate. So that natural evaporative cooling effect that your body has doesn't function. So you're basically about to get heat stroke. And without any kind of special clothing, you can survive inside for 15 or 20 minutes. We had special ice-filled suits with a special backpack filled with ice canisters uh, that went up to through a hose to a fighter pilot-style mask that allowed me to breathe chilled air and blew sort of chilled air onto my eyes to keep my eyes from getting scorched. Holy cow. Yeah. And even with all this gear, I could still only go inside for about 35 to 40 minutes at a time before all the ice melted. And then we'd have to leave, take everything off, put them into freezers, and uh, just all this preparation. You're totally drained, so you drink about a gallon of Mexican tap water. <laughs> and then, then you go back inside for another 40 minutes, uh, about an hour and a half later, once you've rested a little bit. And two years of preparation to go in there for one day, and it was totally worth it. It was just the most beautiful place, just this just chamber of gigantic, gigantic crystals that are so big they're like tree trunks and you're climbing over top of them amazing yeah i saw those you guys did an angry planet episode on those right yes yes absolutely uh, yeah those are amazing I remember, it's funny because i remember the very the very first time i ever saw a photograph of that place it was given to me by a caving friend who showed it to me out in alberta one time years ago and the millisecond that I saw the first photograph, I knew that I was going to go there. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, but I knew that it was going to happen. And it just took years and years and years of perseverance, but it, it did happen, and it was amazing. Well, it sounds like it was absolutely worth it. Completely. It's, uh, it's interesting because the place is sealed off completely now. You can't even go in there as a researcher or a filmmaker, and... The cave itself is below the water table. They actually have gigantic pumps that they use to pump water, the groundwater, out of the uh, out of the mine. Um, and at some point, the mine is going to run out of silver. We don't know when, but at some point, all mines run you know run out of ore. When they do, at some point, they'll end up shutting off the pumps, and the cave and the whole mine will flood with uh, with water, and we'll never see it again. Well, it'll be generations way in the future might rediscover it just like you Maybe, did. yeah. Who knows what's down that's there? Cool. Huh, that's crazy. So you keep coming home. That's a good thing. That's good. But is there a time when things just really went haywire and you, you were wondering if you were going to make it home? Oh, I, I, I've got a couple of, <laughs> a couple of things. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, <laughs> many times. Um, one of the craziest things I've ever done was uh, I was leading an expedition for National Geographic about a year and a half ago to the country of Turkmenistan, which no one has ever heard of, or very few people. It's one of the former Soviet republics. It's just It borders with Afghanistan and uh, Iran, and uh, it's just north of there. And there's a lot of natural gas. So they were drilling for natural gas one, one year, and the drilling rig collapsed into a sinkhole that was about 100 feet deep and 230 feet across. And it was leaking this methane, you know, natural gas is methane, so it's leaking this methane gas. So they lit it on fire thinking it would burn in a couple of days, burn off. And that was in 1971, and it's still burning. <laughs> oh, man. So my mission with National Geographic was to go there. I had a grant from the National Geographic Society, a science grant, to go there and gather soil samples from the bottom of this burning crater called Darvaza. The locals call it the doorway to hell. And it looks like a volcano, but it's burning methane gas, thousands of fires inside this pit. And my mission was to go there, collect soil samples, and then have the DNA, do a DNA analysis on the soil to see if there's any kind of bacteria living down there. And that would give us sort of an idea as to the possibility of life on planets outside of our solar system that have a similar hot methane rich environment and there are planets that have that so it's sort of looking for alien life here on earth 
So that was a real interesting thing. But to do that, one has to get to the bottom of this giant burning crater, right? And to get you know to gather these samples. So it this also took about two years of preparation to get permission from the government. It's very closed off. It's kind of like working in North Korea. It's very much like that. More actually, more people visit North Korea than visit Turkmenistan. About three times the number every year. <laughs> That's saying something. It really is. Nobody goes here. So we spent a week out in the desert, camped out, and I had special fireproof, fire-resistant ropes that we stretched across the entire span, 230 feet across this crater. And I have this special thermal protective heat suit, this silver um, sort of aluminized suit that you would wear in a in a steel mill. And that plus a self-contained uh, breathing tank, all of these different sensors and uh, equipment. And I went out on pulleys on the cross of this rope out to the very center, dangling above this burning pit from a hell, and then rappelled down in the middle of the open air, down to the very center of the pit, and was able to gather samples. And as I was digging in the ground to gather the samples, fire was coming out of the hole that I was digging. <laughs> it, was, it was literally like, I, I describe it as being like standing in the middle of a coliseum of fire. And I only had 15 minutes worth of air. So I'm doing all this stuff as quickly as I can. I'm, I've got this special temperature probe. I'm taking temperature readings. I'm shooting video. I'm gathering samples. My air quality alarm starts going off. Uh, a few minutes later, my low air on my tank alarm starts going off. <laughs> so all these alarms are going off. And I, it's like, okay, it's time to go. I don't want to get trapped down here. And uh, I gave the signal to my crew up top to haul me up and out. And I'm starting to get really lightheaded and I'm on the verge of passing out at this point. But they were able to haul me out. It was just an unbelievable thing. And we were successful. We found bacteria down there that did not exist in the existing uh, DNA database. So we actually were able to find life in the place that you would not expect. It was so hellish and just so inhospitable down there. Amazing. Wow, that's cool. And, Mission success. Yeah, absolutely. And to put things in perspective, 12 people have stood on the surface of the moon. Only one person has been to the bottom of that crater. No kidding. Yeah. Man, that's a claim to fame right there. Yeah, I was very proud of that. <laughs> and, uh, and it just <laughs> took awesome. so much effort. And it was one of the most difficult things I've ever done from a political standpoint, from an organizational standpoint. And I tell you, when you're standing on the edge of that thing, there's so much heat coming off of it. It's so intimidating. And then to just step off into the void and put all of your weight on that rope, that takes a lot of trust. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, and knowing that no one has ever done it before, so there's no precedent. We didn't know how hot it was at the bottom. We didn't know what kind of gas there was. We didn't know all of these, all these things that I might encounter down there because no one had ever done it before. It was a truly uh, unique environment. So would that rank as the coolest place you visited or the scariest? Uh, certainly the scariest. <laughs> certainly the scariest. Um, I, certainly, it's not the scariest. It's not the most frightened I've ever been. But uh, fear and I have an interesting relationship. Um, I respect fear. I, I'm not without fear. People say to me frequently, oh, you must be totally fearless. And I answer them, honestly, no, no. Um, I embrace be. fear because if I don't have fear, that's when I make mistakes. Right. If I experience Absolutely. fear, that means that I need to take action. So for me, it's an action call. If I'm afraid, then something's wrong and I need to do something about this. And if I don't have that, then I'm going to be complacent. I'm going to make mistakes. And I've had that happen before. I've been complacent and I've made mistakes and they have almost cost me very dearly. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't have fear, there's something seriously wrong with you. It's a human emotion, and it's one that is there to, to give you the signals. Exactly. It's for survival. Yeah, it's there for a reason. <laughs> it's, it's part of your survival instinct. When I start losing my survival instinct, that's when I know it's time for me to retire. <laughs> exactly. You might want to take up a new career. <laughs> well, I, was, I was in a cave in Kenya, another caving incident. Um, and this cave is known for two reasons. Number one, elephants go inside the cave and scrape they scrape the cave walls to, to chew the rocks to get salt in their diet. It's a very unique behavior. Huh. But also it was the epicenter for two outbreaks of an Ebola-type virus called Marburg hemorrhagic fever, and it's spread by the bats that live in this cave. And basically, to make a long story short, I was in there with a bat biologist, and there were thousands of bats flying past us, and I had protective surgical gloves, and I had uh, a respirator on, Tyvex coveralls, eye protection, helmet... 
And I grab one of these bats and I go to show the camera and the bat bites through my surgical glove and into my thumb. Oh, and now I don't know if I've caught this Ebola type virus. I don't know if I've got a week and a half left to live before my internal organs turn to jello and I start bleeding out of my eyes. Things like that. So, <laughs> you know, another day. I'm just sitting here in awe. Just another day in the office. <laughs> This, this, this place, Kittim Cave, it was profiled in the, in the very famous book, The Hot Zone, uh, all about the Ebola virus. And uh, it's a beautiful place, but I can't really recommend it as a vacation hotspot. No, no, that's, uh, let's leave that one out. Yeah, I don't need to go back either. It's like I can check that one off my bucket list. Uh, Been there, crazy. done that, don't need to go back. <laughs> <laughs> so you've described some of the scariest places. What would you say is the coolest destination you've ever traveled to? <sighs> Well, the Crystal Cave, for sure, is just incredibly cool. Um, places like New Zealand are amazing because you can do so much in such a small area. There's there's mountains, there's volcanoes, there's scuba diving, there's beaches, there's cosmopolitan cities. There's every kind of terrain you can imagine, extreme sports. You can go bungee jumping. You can do, you can do anything. It's awesome. Um, Iceland, as well, is just a wonderful jewel. If you love the natural world, if you want to go and experience an adventure... Iceland is a great place to do it. The Antarctica, I've been there three times now. You can close your eyes, lift up your camera, take a series of pictures, and every single one of them is going to look like a postcard. Wow. It's amazing. That sounds awesome. Yeah, Iceland is one of the places that's definitely been on my list of, of things to do and to see. I cannot h- recommend it highly enough. I'm itching to go back to Iceland. I fell in love with that place within minutes and I just yearn to go back I want to take a second to tell you about The Nomadic it's a subscription box curated for outdoor enthusiasts by outdoor enthusiasts so each month you get a hand picked selection of the latest and greatest outdoor gear that's been trip tested and approved by the Nomadic product team, which is made up of guides, athletes, and you know, bona fide adventurers. They partner with brands like Mountain Smith, Gear Aid, Sea Lion, Mizu, Empowered, RX Bar, and a lot more. This month's theme is Relax to the Max. So one item inside is an exclusive hammock by Lawson Hammocks, an award-winning hammock maker who's been voted number one by Backpacker and Outside Magazine. So order by May 14th to get this box. So get quality gear by brands you trust delivered right to your doorstep monthly. Learn more at thenomadic.com slash ASP. This episode is also sponsored by CS Instant Coffee, 100% Arabica coffee with compostable packaging. And you can find them at csinstant.coffee. And use Adventure at checkout for 20% off. So what about current projects? What are you working on these days? What are, what are some things you want to tell people about? Well, we just wrapped uh, production on season four of Angry Planet uh, for Pivot Television in the U.S. So check your local cable provider to see if you have Pivot Television. And uh, so they're going to be airing, they tell me, in the, at the beginning of January or 2016. I don't know exactly when. They don't have the dates yet. But the the newest five episodes will be airing in in, um, January. So watch out for that. If you live in Canada, season three is about to start airing on the Weather Network. And uh, that's stuff that we filmed a few years ago, but uh, it'll be new for the Weather Network. So that's uh, that's all happening. So I'm basically right now, I'm in between seasons. I just got back from Ireland where I I got a, a medal from the Explorers Museum over there in Tullamore, Ireland, which was a real honor for my uh, explorations and such. And uh, so it's just been busy, busy, busy. Right now I'm also planning to hopefully next month go to South Georgia Island, which is basically, if you look at the map and look at the Falkland Islands, basically due east of there in the middle of the extreme southern part of the... uh, of the Atlantic, where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Southern Ocean. And if all goes well, I'll be there for the last two weeks of October. Fingers crossed. And what are you going out there for? Uh, Filming with the Canadian Weather Network. And that is the place where those giant elephant seals, some of them weigh Uh. more than a car, and they fight on the beach, just slamming into each other, just like two (laughs) semi-trucks in a head-on collision. 
of blubber and teeth uh, and just an amazing spectacle of nature. They call it the Galapagos of the South because there's so much wildlife between the penguins and the elephant seals. There's just so much biomass. So I'm really hoping to go there. And that's the spot where Ernest Shackleton, the famous explorer Ernest Shackleton, he, one of his ships in Antarctica got trapped in the ice and was crushed. His crew was trapped in Antarctica back at the turn of the beginning of the, ninth, of the uh, 1900s, 19, 1907, I do believe, around there. And they, they had to survive in Antarctica for over a year. And Shackleton and a few of his men took a small lifeboat and they made it all the way to South Georgia Island for rescue. He didn't lose a single man. They all survived. Wow. Great tale of exploration, leadership, and survival in some of the most harsh environments uh, on the planet. So I'm hoping to uh, to visit the site of where he was rescued as well. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. You know, it's funny talking to you. It's uh, it's going to sound dumb, but you know, I love watching these documentaries and shows that you do, um, all all kinds. And you know, it's funny talking to you because it it finally clicks that there's somebody out there doing it. You know, I know that sounds dumb, but it's kind of like one of those things. Like when it's on TV, it's like, well, you know, things are getting filmed and whatnot, but you don't really think about people being involved and you yeah. getting on a plane and leaving your family to go do this and uh, put your, put your life in your, take your life in your hands oh, to do yeah, it. And and the it's, process. it's and, a realization. Yeah, and, and like the hours and hours and hours you spend on a plane and the planning and preparation and dealing with <laughs> insurance companies and, you know, it, like I had to go to do that Turkmenistan expedition into the crater of fire. I had to deal with Lloyd's of London because they were the only insurance company that would, that would touch me. <laughs> um, so there's all this stuff that goes on just to be able to show people, you know, an hour's worth of some crazy place. Right. You know, it can be weeks or months or sometimes years of planning and preparation and passion and dedication just to, to show some of these places. And it's funny because years ago I made a really important decision in my life. Basically people wonder what the meaning of life is. Well, my advice to anyone is that it's up to you to decide what the meaning of life is. And once I understood that, I was able to embrace it. And so I made up the meaning of life for me. And that is to travel the world, document the most extreme places, and then share what I've seen with as many people as possible. And every decision that I make every day from what I decide to do, every email I send, everything from from just doing these expeditions to sharing what I've seen through television, through the web, through podcasts like yours, through all of these different these avenues and vehicles, all are aligned, laser focused along the lines of that sort of mission statement that I've created for myself. And it's become very effective for me. Um, I, I'm completely unemployable. <laughs> I don't think I can hold a regular <laughs> job. No, I don't think so. <laughs> and it's 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 weird being a full time professional explorer and adventurer. And it started off with storm chasing, but it has expanded so much and just changed so greatly over the years to encompass anything involving the natural world. And I'm very grateful for all of the opportunities that I've been given. And, and it's it's a lot of hard work being lucky. Yeah, that's a great opportunity. I love your your outlook on the meaning of life. It's a it's a great way to think about it. It's your life. The meaning is yours. Exactly. You know, your, your meaning of life may not be my meaning of oh, life. And I, that's an yeah. excellent way to look exactly. at it. Exactly, and it shouldn't be. Everyone should be unique and, and clear. And as long as I'm contributing, as long as I'm growing, then I'm going to be fulfilled, right? The, the rents, you know, the, the mortgage, it gets paid one way or another. Somehow it gets paid, <laughs> and that's good. <laughs> but it's the fulfilling of of that particular mission. I love sharing my experiences with these places almost as much as I love going to these places. So I do a lot of talks and things at museums and schools and libraries and just places all over the world. I've done four TEDx talks and just getting the word out and showing people how amazing this planet is. We spend so much time going from our air-conditioned house to our air-conditioned car to our air-conditioned office. When was the last time you touched a tree? You know, we, we're so detached from the natural world that we sort of take it for granted. We don't think about it very often until it affects us through a power outage or you know, the Wi-Fi is down or a big storm rolls through town. But we're part of the natural world and 
we're as interwoven as any other species with the natural world. And we forget that a lot of times. And I just want people to, hey, you know, step away from your computer, put down your phone and get outside. It's pretty cool. Out there. And you hit the nail on the head. The uh, it, it is very true. And we're getting worse and worse with social media and communicating through email and really not seeing people face to face or get out in the environment. Obviously, one of the reasons we do this podcast is to inspire people to get out there. They hear awesome stories like yours and, and the other adventurers we've had on the show and hopefully are are kind of getting a, a, a bug to get out there and, and try a few of these things. Now, I'm not encouraging people to go hike up to the edge of a, a volcano and peer over at the lava lake below, but there's a lot of cool things that we can get out and, uh, and toy with oh, to, uh, ab- to make life awesome. Absolutely, and it's all about stepping out of your comfort zone, and that's different for each person. Obviously, I've been doing this for so many years. My comfort zone is pretty wide. <laughs> but I can get just as much of a thrill or, 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 or fear or whatever you want to experience or whatever you want to call it from doing something that you're comfortable with. What, what makes me afraid is different from what makes someone else afraid, right? So things that I do seem scary to some, things that you do might be scary to me. And it's all about stepping out of your own comfort zone, doing things that you've never done before. And that is how we grow as people. And that's where you get fulfilled. And that's how, that's how, that's where the magic and the juice is in life is, is, is doing stuff that you've never done before. Yeah, absolutely. Before I get too far along, where can people visit to find out more about you and follow you? Uh, the easiest way is just to go over to my website, which is furiousearth.com. And there you'll find links to all my Twitter feed and Facebook and YouTube channel and all that. So it's all, all can be found in one place. So that's probably the easiest thing. I'm a little behind on updating my website, but I'm pretty good on social media, so I'm keeping that stuff pretty much up to date. So if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, you'll be able to uh, stay as up to date as, as, uh, as possible on all the adventures. And I try to uh, send tweets out from some of the most remote places, so it's, it's a lot of fun. That's cool. Well, I'll definitely get those linked up in the show notes so people can uh, go find them and uh, and see what you're up to. So aside from trying to eat a 72-ounce steak at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Unsuccessfully. <laughs> yes, I would be too. What's a, what's a good funny story from your adventures? <laughs> oh, I remember this one time. There's been a lot of funny, bizarre stories, but uh, I don't know. This one sticks out of my mind. We were in Indonesia filming on the island of Java and it's full of volcanoes and we were traveling from one volcano to another and we we were driving we come across this huge celebration in this town and there's this uh, people are having this feast and there's music and there's this horse that is adorned with just these wonderful just costume of sort of jewels and bright orange fluorescent oranges and pinks and the the horse is prancing and sort of dancing along with the people it's just it's this amazing spectacle so we stop and watch and and we don't don't speak any indonesian and they sort of they invite us in and we sort of become the guests of honor at this giant party and we're sort of led to believe that it's a wedding so okay we're we're being invited to this big wedding party and they're, they're giving us food and everyone seems to be having a good time and it's all great (laughs) <laughs> and then we find out it's not a wedding party. It's a circumcision party for two of the local boys oh, that are, no. I think, 12 and 13 years old. So a little old for that. And it's like, ah, oh, yikes. Okay. <laughs> Could you imagine <laughs> inviting a bunch of foreigners, some strangers who just happen to be driving past to your son's circumcision party? I just not don't see that happening least. here in the West. It was just, no. it was a wonderful gesture, but. It, <laughs> It struck me a bit odd. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was an awesome odd. party. <laughs> Uncomfortable, though. It was a bit awkward. <laughs> that's funny. So you've done a million things. Again, we've touched on, man, I, just a small percentage of what you've done. What's still on your to-do list? What are the things that you'd still like to check off before you quit doing this? Uh, I've never experienced a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, Hurricane Katrina was the strongest that I ever, ever encountered. It was a five up to a couple of hours before it made landfall, and then it weakened a bit. So I would definitely like to do that. Um, I've never experienced a typhoon in the Pacific, which is the same as a hurricane, just in the Pacific instead of the Atlantic. But I still have yet to do that, either in Japan or Taiwan or Philippines. That is high on my on my uh, sort of to-do list. There are five places in the world that have volcanoes with permanent lakes of lava in them 
I've been to four out of the five. So wow. that last one is Mount Erebus in uh, Antarctica. It's very difficult and very uh, challenging to get to, but that is high on my list. I've never been to China or Japan or Mongolia. I want to visit all of those. I want to get to the North Pole. Uh, I want to swim in Palau's Jellyfish Lake. Uh, I literally have a list, like a bucket list. I don't call it a bucket list. It's too negative. I call it a life list. <laughs> and it's just just filled with all these things I want to accomplish and all these places I want to go. And it seems that every time I strike one item off, I tend to add two more to the list. So it's uh, I actually literally do keep a list like that. That's cool. That is very cool. Well, I hope to uh, to follow you through all of these adventures and, and watch you check off your list and, uh, and and be there as you do it. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to come back on maybe in a year and we'll talk about uh, things that have updated since then because it's, it's, uh, there's always, always something going on. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to have you. George, thank you so much for coming on and sharing these stories. It's been awesome to to hear what your life is is all about, and uh, I really encourage people to go out and check out the the documentaries that George is putting out. It's fascinating, obviously. Um, it's just uh, I appreciate you taking the time to do it. My pleasure. Thank you, Travis. All right. Take care. Cheers. Well, first of all, thank you so much for listening to this episode. It really means the world to us that you want to spend your time with us. If you'd like to help us further, please just leave us a review on iTunes, share us on social media, tell your friends about us. You can become a patron, a supporter of the show for $5 a month at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. And if you know somebody that would make a good guest, reach out. We're always looking for good adventure and outdoor stories. And lastly, thank you to our sponsors, whose messages follow right now. Athletic Brewing makes the best non-alcoholic craft beer. Go to their website at athleticbrewing.com and use the code in our show notes to save 15% on your first order. The Nomadic, the first outdoor subscription box that helps you go on more adventures with the latest gear by delivering themed monthly boxes with innovative products and an outdoor challenge to match. Learn more at thenomadic.com slash ASP. After all this adventure talk, if you're needing some gear yourself, but you need some advice before buying, go to backpacktribe.com where you can ask questions to the owners who have experience with all the gear as well as all of it for sale right there on their website.